Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Victoria Mix Accelerator Program. Today is the second in our pitching and presentation series. And uh, today we're going to look at presenting, particularly online, like a pro. I'm Collins Rex, and uh, I'm the lead for the Victoria Mets Export Hub. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, which for me is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Straits Islanders peoples who might be joining us on today's webinar. Our speaker today is Dave Yates. Dave Yates is a forward thinker, he's a strategist and an architect of change. He's uh, individually coached over 300 business leaders in the mining, engineering, METS and uh, services sector all over Australia. And Dave is adept at uh, how enterprises and mining operations engage with their future workforce, digital transformation, disruption and growth. Dave focuses on enterprise architecture, innovation and growth, stretching strategy, navigating complexity, and growing processes to be more value-oriented, purposeful, and stable in a complex and changing world. And uh, Dave, as I mentioned, is uh, the one who's going to be taking you through today's presentation. And by the end of it, you'll be presenting like a pro. So Dave, uh, I'm going to hand over control to you and uh, all yours. Thank you so much, Collins. Appreciate it. And uh, welcome to everyone online as well. Today, we are going to be talking about presenting like a pro. So I better have my game face on and I better be presenting as such. I'm very mindful of the fact that I've got to be um, modeling all the things I suggest we should be doing today. So um, I apologize in advance for what is out of my control because there is a small chance that they're going to do some, be doing some renovations above me. Uh, and if that does happen, uh, we, we may get some noise interference, but that is just the way things go. You never quite know what's going to happen when you're presenting remotely and you've got to be able to adapt and shift with the changes and be able to give context to the people on the other side of the call. And that's all part of being able to present like a pro. So in front of you in the presentation, you'll see the areas we're going to be covering today, uh, how you set up, how you sound how you look and how you start. So really just getting the fundamentals down pat about before you even say anything, do you have everything set up and ready to go? Have you done the right preparation? Are you wearing the right clothing? Are you, are you set up in the right way? And then from there, we'll go into how you present, potentially what you could be presenting and how you could sharpen that. And also then how you wrap up and how you do a reasonable job of finishing. Um, throughout the presentation, I'll invite you to ask as many questions as you can in the Q&A section of the uh, of the Zoom call and more than happy to answer them at the end. Um, I'll go through the presentation. We'll be able to collect them at the end and go through them in as much detail as we have time for. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get into um, how we set up. And if I can, there we go. So oh, I might actually go back there if I can. There we go. So this is the context we now live in. And one of the reasons why I wanted to show this particular photo is because it's not all uniform. What we're dealing with isn't just a single person on the end of a conversation online. In fact, you might have single people at the end of a Zoom call in some circumstances. And in others, you might be dealing with a whole range of people in a boardroom watching this conversation. I've been in facilitations where we've had two boardrooms dial into a conversation in a separate room, and then we've had three or four people dial in individually from their homes. I've had ones where we've had an entire in-person event with two or three people joining remotely. I've had an entire in-person event where the speaker joined remotely and addressed the room from, from London. It really depends, and this is the, I guess, the pandemic era we're now in and recognizing the need for um for your audience to connect with you is probably step one in this whole process is recognizing if you're going to present like a pro then you need to understand who's on the other side and potentially if possible wherever possible how they're going to show up 
on the other side of that particular call. Because if you can understand who's in the room and how they're in the room, you're going to be able to engage with them in a much more meaningful way. So context is always king. And it's not always as simple as one person on the other side of the call. Um, so what happens in these particular circumstances is not only do you have your own body language that you're trying to speak with and connect with, but you're also connecting with an audience that, to be quite frank, can use body language on, the, on their side of the call better than you ever will because they're in person with other people. And if you've got that, then you've got to be able to engage um, through a screen better than someone else can engage in person. Or at the very least, you need to be able to earn their respect so they give you that, uh, that time and that energy uh, facing to you like these people are in this screen, facing towards the screen because whoever's giving the presentation is in fact uh, engaging enough to be a part of that conversation. So... First and foremost, how do we set up? Let's get the fundamentals right. I think first things first, and I, I really do mean there's a high speed, stable internet connection. Uh, nothing can be more difficult to work with than an unstable internet connection. And by stable, I mean, do you, does the connection, I mean, to get really technical, does the connection drop packets? Now, packets are little tiny parcels of information that go between Zoom servers and your computer so that you can hear and see what's being presented. Now, we've got all of this amazing digital technology, but what we're missing or what we, what we lose with the amazing digital technology is... Um, the permission to be a little bit off. Have you ever noticed when you're watching digital TV, when most TV now is digital, is you don't get the white noise anymore. It doesn't sort of hiss up and you don't get all the, the feedback and the noise on the, on the screen. Instead, if your antenna is bad or if you've got bad reception for that particular channel, you either don't get the channel or you just get it all jarbled and, and, and um, you don't actually the full picture or the sound drops out or it kind of uh, fragments a little bit. That's what happens when you drop packets. So an unstable internet connection will drop packets. And that means that you may be clear and visible on, on, a, on a connection and it may look good, or you may be able to even just dial in and start talking. But if you're dropping packets, you're actually going to, um, oh, hang on. There we go. Um, if you're dropping packets, then you're actually going to be uh, sounding like you're dropping in and out of the conversation or your, uh, your video will freeze up entirely. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we've got a stable internet connection that Zoom can work with or the Teams can work with or whatever else you might be using. Um, and if that means you have to move spaces, do your entire audience a favor and move. Go somewhere, rent an office, even if it's just for the day, just so that you know that you've got that stable internet connection. If we're thinking about presenting professionally for a pitch, this could be a really significant moment in your business. Give it the time it deserves and don't try and get by on a dodgy internet connection you might have at the home, at home or at the office. The next thing to look at is actually your desk and how you're set up. You want to have an appropriate desk. Now, I'm at the moment, I'm sitting down at my desk. I'm pretty comfortable working in a sitting down environment. And as you can probably see, I've set up my office so that it looks okay behind me from a, uh, from a setup point of view. I've got my business logo in this corner. I've got a light source in this corner. I've got some plants above me. I'm, I'm trying to make it look like it's, it's uh, nice to look at without needing to have a background. The alternative, of course, is that you can, in fact, put a digital background up there as well. We'll get into that in a little bit. You want to make sure you've got sufficient space. And ideally, you want to have two screens. And I'll tell you why. First things first, you want to have sufficient space to be able to step back and use your hands in talking. Why do we want to use our hands? Because if all you are is a talking head, then you're going to lose the opportunity to engage with the audience and to provide a three-dimensional experience where you can move in and out towards the camera and you can engage with them in a meaningful way. It seems like it's a little naff, but it's amazing how much of a difference something as simple as hand actions in the midst of a Zoom call can do in terms of engaging your audience and just giving a fresh take on how things are. So appropriate desk, if it's a sit-stand desk, 
Give yourself the choice. Do you want to stand up for this presentation? Do you want to sit down? What's the right height for your computer and for you uh, to make that work? And we'll get into that in a little bit as well. And then ideally, you do actually want two screens, particularly if you're running a presentation like we're doing today. And the reason for that is because you want to be able to have a different screen. My other screen's over here and my camera screen is here. And you want to be able to see what you're presenting on one screen and see everyone else that's on your call on the other screen. And there's a few tactics in that to make it feel really, really um, nuanced and thoughtful about how you set up those screens. But most important is to be able to separate your work from your conversation so that you can focus on the work when that's important and then focus on the conversation when that's important and you're not jumping between windows and getting lost a little bit as well. The other thing to think about in terms of how you set up and what you're doing when you're getting started before you even dial into a Zoom or a Teams call is to think about if you're the one presenting, then have nothing else on but the presentation. Don't accidentally hit play on a YouTube video. Don't accidentally own it, open an email while you're trying to share a screen that no one's supposed to read or whatever it might be, particularly if you're in a, in a market-sensitive environment. You don't want to be showing the contents of your inbox by accident if you're making a presentation. So it's really important to understand that you give the presentation the time it deserves and as well um, give the camera and the laptop the, uh, the, the, the right position and elevation. You'll notice in this particular call, the, the camera is pretty much at my eye level. If I run my hand out from my eye, my camera is pretty much at my eye level. And I'm that's a deliberate move. My, my laptop is actually on a stand that's elevating the camera up a little bit higher so that I can speak directly straight forward. There's a big, there's a big, um, uh, what's the word? There's a big change that happens in the way people perceive you when you're not looking up someone's nose. And I actually don't mean that it's because you're looking up someone's nose, but because if you're looking down, you tuck your chin in and you face down and you speak down. And so your, your whole body language actually hunches over and you end up talking through the lower part of your jaw. And so everything becomes quite monotonous when you're down here because you can't inflect very much at all because you're all focusing down. And at the same time, the audience is looking up your nose, which isn't great either. So instead, what you want to do is elevate the screen, have it at least at eye level, if not even higher. I'd love to have potentially even higher um, as time goes on. And the reason for this is because any vocal coach or any presentation or speaking trainer will tell you that one of the best ways to engage with your audience is to lift your eyebrows. For whatever reason, speaking with lifted eyebrows, like I'm doing right now, is incredibly engaging and drawing. It's an inviting uh, body sense of body language that pulls people into the conversation. It's very hard to do that when you're looking down. It's a lot easier to do that when you're looking up. So it's a much more engaging presentation just by lifting the laptop up or just by lifting the camera up to above your eye level or at least at your eye level rather than below it when you're looking down. So it's a neat little hack, but it can make all the difference in terms of your presentations. The other thing is thinking about you, how you're squared up within the frame of the picture. How much of your lower torso is there? How much above your head is visible? And how much room have you got to move as a presenter within the window that you've got? Give that some thought. Have a think about what that means for you and potentially how you could be structuring not only the room around you, but even the orientation of your camera and your laptop as you set that up. Recognizing as well that your surroundings have a meaningful play, part to play in this as well. No distractions, absolute privacy where possible, and making it as professional as possible. There was a lot of forgiveness for two and a half years, really, in, in terms of moving through the different ways you could have a home set up and dial into a Teams or a Zoom meeting. But I think um, in much the same way that a pitching coach would tell you, get your get your pitch deck designed by a designer because you want to make sure that your investor or that your potential customer gets the message that you care about this deal. In the same way, you want to make sure that your potential customer or your investor gets the message that you care about this call and this conversation. Dialing in from the family kitchen 
or having a conversation with kids running around behind you. Yes, it may be the only option, but it's also not too hard these days to find a co-working space that you can rent for a couple of hours and potentially even getting just a little meeting room you can make use of for a few hours with an internet connection that's stable and high speed enough to, to make these things work. So they're the kind of fundamentals you want to get at is high speed, stable internet, an accurate desk with sufficient laptop height or camera height so that you can engage at eye level and then no distractions and giving it the professional courtesy that this particular presentation and setup deserves as well. Um, how you sound. The quality of how you sound, oh, I've gone too far again. Quality of how you sound should be second only to the quality of your internet connection. And I want you to think about that for a second. The quality of how you sound should be second only to the quality of your internet connection. Now, I'm kind of spoiled for choice where I am at the moment. I've got a brand new laptop that has a relatively good microphone, but I've also got a really nice microphone. So I use the Rode NT microphone. It's a, um, a professional grade USB plug-in microphone. So it just plugs into the USB port on my computer and off I go. And it gives me a really nice, crisp, compressed sound when I'm, when I'm dialing into calls like this. And Zoom and Teams just add as an input device I can select and make it my default and off I go. So it's not a huge taxing cost. It's something that makes a big difference with me. And it gives me an enormous amount of um, depth to my voice. And it's amazing how much that um, how much of a difference that makes. I would almost opt for, no, I would opt for bad video or even no video with good audio over really great video and really crummy audio. So things to be careful of in this particular circumstance is things like Bluetooth headphones. Probably the biggest mistake I see people make is they grab things like their AirPods and they pop their AirPods in their ear and they think they're dialing in with their AirPods in. And what they don't know is that the people on the other side of the call sound like they're having a phone conversation with someone in the car because that tinny Bluetooth sound is coming through to the Zoom call and you're not giving that deep resonance that you would get from a professional microphone. You're better off using the microphone on the computer. So if you're going to use a microphone, think about potentially what, what would be worthwhile the investment. It doesn't have to be a super expensive microphone, but thinking about how you can improve the microphone that you're using, whether that's a headset with a wraparound microphone, like maybe you've got um, lying around place or maybe it's a, um, something like a snowball or one of these road mics. There's plenty of options out there at varying price points, but thinking about how that could potentially impact your presentation and make sure that you're clearly heard. Think about it. If you're making a pitch in a presentation, part of that pitch and presentation is actually about exhibiting confidence and exhibiting that you have what it takes. Yes, the content is important. Yes, the sales pitch is important, but equally so is how that sales pitch is developed and how you deliver that tone of voice and that resonance that says, I've got confidence in my profit, in my product. You should believe me. You should trust in me, invest in me and become my customer. And that kind of thing is much easier to convey with high quality equipment. The other thing to be careful of as well is to test the microphone before the call. I have had the disastrous experience of buying a brand new set of headphones with a little lapel microphone that came down the back end of it. And all I got was some very tolerant people putting up with me for 25 minutes before one of them piped up at one point and said, Dave, we actually can't hear you very well. I don't know what's going on with your headphones, but they're not very good and you're dropping in and out. I thought it was my internet connection. I dialed back in the next time at a better spot with a better internet connection. And it was the same story all over again. They said, mate, lose the headphones. Just talk to us like, um, just talk to us on speaker. We'll be fine with that. So recognizing that that's an opportunity and, and how we can make that work. The other thing to think about is acoustic control. So how are you manage? How are you managing the echoes or the distractions or the, the other frequencies? 
Um, so I use a local co-working space um, and occasionally upstairs there's a renovation, which is out of my control. There's not much I can do with it other than apologize to you that this kind of thing happens. Um, but otherwise I'm in an acoustically controlled environment with a closed door. I don't get bothered. I don't have anything. Um, and again, it could just be your home office. It could just be your office at work. Um, but using a space or finding a space that has control of the acoustics so that you can speak without having to worry about being too loud and your audience can listen and they don't get distracted by what's going on in the background as well. So being careful of both those Bluetooth headphones and obviously testing the mic before you call as well. Now, how do you look? What we want to do is we want to minimize distractions and we want to maximize engagement with what you have to say. So what we're not looking to do is make a fashion statement. What we are looking to do is to demonstrate confidence. Part of this thing is, again, it's not just what you've got to say, it's how you've got to say it. And some of that is in your look. So think about things like wear a collar. Why would you wear a collar? It's actually about the way it frames your face. If you're wearing just a simple uh, T-shirt that runs around like this, everything kind of rounds off around your face and you don't get the framing you get with a collar that seems much more three-dimensional and situates yourself on screen a little bit better. So think about the way, you know, webcams aren't the best and they're usually quite fish-eyed in the way they, they represent themselves. So try and get away from that two-dimensional image by wearing three-dimensional clothing a little bit and that'll give you a sense of depth in the way that you can present on screen. You also want to remind people. You want to remind people where you're from, what you work with, how you work. Um, and that can either be by wearing a logo on your shirt, wearing a, you know some kind of shirt with, with branding on it, having the logo behind you like I've got, um, whatever it might be. Or it might be like, uh, like the Ostmine guys on the call do. They've got their, their backgrounds with Ostmine um, branding on it as well. So there's all sorts of options you can use to to pull in accessories almost that give people that reminder and potentially even use uh, those backgrounds for, for that kind of purpose. In addition, those backgrounds, those fake backgrounds or image backgrounds that you can put in behind you can be really great ways to get people to learn more about you or to, to understand a bit more about your brand. You know, it can just be a place for your logo, but I've used QR codes on there before. I've used all sorts of different things to try and get people to see that there are opportunities here to present um, in, 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 a, in a myriad of different ways. And if probably what you've got to look at is the inside of a spare bedroom, um, then maybe a, a background is, is the right way to go. Um, where, where you've got the luxury um, to put, you know, some nice plants or, or an image or a picture or a logo, then go right ahead and do that as well. What we want to make sure we've got though, and this is the really important bit, is sufficient lighting. I'm in a really well-lit office at the moment and I'm pretty happy with the way it lights up my face in a in a conversation because what I've got is side light that's coming in from either side and top light that's lighting up the whole room without getting too bright and it means that I can use my facial expressions and I can use my hands and there's depth and control to it it's not too washed out so we want to be thinking about lighting as much as possible and saying how do we get the best light Again, there's some accessories you can use to bring in extra lighting, potentially light filters and things that can sit behind the computer to light you up a little bit better. Um, and thinking about also how you, how you bring yourself to that conversation as well. So you'll see the picture on the slide of the guy wearing his pajama pants and his suit jacket on top. And we've all done this. And particularly through 2020 and 2021, you know, there was plenty of opportunities to go to work half half on, half still in your PJs. Um, but what we've what we have realized is that there are opportunities to get up and move about, or you might be saying thanks or goodbye and turning and moving away and having to get up. And if you do get up and you haven't prepared for getting up for that particular conversation, you can put yourself into a bit of an embarrassing situation. So dress the part, look the part. And what you're trying to do is maximize engagement with the content and with the confidence you have in delivering that content rather than just the distractions that come with things like, oops, I forgot, or the bad, the lighting's bad, or we're getting light flares or distractions behind you, or I'm wearing the wrong pants or whatever it might be. That's the job. How you look is about minimizing those distractions and maximizing the focus on what you've got to say and how you've got 
to say it. Getting to the next one, how you start. So this is a really big one. I'm really passionate about this. It's not just about what you've got to say. You're only as good as the people you've got listening to you. And if they've switched off, then you might have the best thing to say, but they're never going to hear it. So how do you grab the room's attention and hold it over that initial hump to get people to go, oh, I'm interested. Okay, what, what have they got to say? So my first piece of advice would be introduce the context. Why are we having this conversation and what's this brought about by them? Outline the purpose or the intent. You know, I typically like to say what we're going to do is go through these things like I've given you the agenda at the start and said we're in a post-pandemic world and we've got to figure out how to do these kind of presentations as best we can with the tools we've got. So it's very easy to start to get that context and that purpose going without having to overkill it and talk too long. But perhaps you want to build in a story with this kind of work as well and start to build a bit more of a, a bridge between the context and the purpose and what you're trying to do and the piece of content that you've got to deliver or develop or whatever. It's, I've got a, um, one, one example of this is I jumped into a meeting that I was late for. I arrived two, three minutes, it wasn't enormously late, but I was feeling flustered because I hadn't arrived in my office in time. And so I jumped on my computer, hit the Zoom call, arrived in and I'm still panting while we're doing the introductions, knowing that I was ready to present on the next, uh, the next piece. What's happened is they've seen me come in. They've seen, they've been nervous because I haven't been able to, to jump in in time and, and, uh, and they've thrown straight to me. And in my fluster, I've jumped straight to the content. Go, 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 go. And I've missed the context. And eventually, after about five minutes of very polite silence, one of my colleagues has said, hey, Dave, how about we go back and you give us a bit of an understanding of why we're having this conversation? And it was a bit one of those sort of face palm moments where I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so flustered and rushed. So give yourself the time. Slow down and do the work to give yourself, give the audience the context for the conversation outline the purpose for the conversation. If it's a customer pitch where you're trying to get new business overseas, which is, you know, there's an export hub, then part of the conversation may be, listen, I'd like to have a conversation with you about how we can potentially do business in XYZ, in Indonesia or in Chile. And what I'd like to do is present to you some examples of where we've done this kind of business here in Australia. And if we're going to export to Chile, I'd like to understand what that means for you and some of the concerns you might have, because I've got a story about when. And that way you can put in the context, you can outline the purpose or the intent of the conversation, and then you can bring it down to a story that really connects and resonates with people and pulls everything together. The things you really have to be careful about is that without context, people get really lost. It can be the clearest, most succinct presentation, but if they don't know what's going on or why this conversation is happening, then it's really hard for them to catch up. So even if it's a little bit of a, even if it's something that you feel like the whole audience knows and knows really, really well, it's good to just revisit the conversation about why. Why are we having this conversation? If you're pretty confident the conversation is done and that's been had, then just revisit it in one sentence. Listen, I'm here today to have a conversation because blah, 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 blah. Then you move straight into it. So you don't want to jump in too quickly you want to make sure you give context the credit it's due because it does actually gauge and guide the entire conversation as much as possible. So what do I do in this particular conversation or how do I get started? I like as best I can. I like to open with gratefulness. I want to make sure that whoever's introducing me to this conversation, even if it's a cold lead and you're opening a conversation just on the pure internal referral of someone and their boss, you want to make sure you're thanking them. You want to open up with gratefulness because it shows a warm heart and it shows that you're open to invitation and that you're a good actor and that whatever you're having isn't just a slimy sales pitch, but you're actually genuinely thankful for the opportunity uh, to share 
the opportunity to take up some of their time in their day and the opportunity given to you by the referring person who's got you this particular meeting or pitch in the first place. Then what I want to do is introduce um, much to what Collins has done at the start of this particular conversation is this is in fact uh, who we're talking with today. This is what's going on. So if I'm in a, in a call with someone else, I'll introduce myself. I'll introduce people I'm on the call with. I'll throw the mic to them, make sure they've said their piece and that they're a part of the conversation as well. Uh, and make sure that that context is a grateful context that gives people a sense of, okay, these guys are here or these guys and girls are here and they're here with a purpose. They're here for a reason. And then we can connect to why we're here and what we'd like to do. And I love to, as best I can, open with those case studies and those stories that can really get people over the hump because that initial five to 10 minutes when people are like, am I really going to stick around for this? I'd love to leave early for lunch. Getting them into 10 minutes and saying, no, no, I'm going to have to push lunch back. This is really interesting. Has a lot more to do with your ability to captivate an audience, speak with your hands, tell stories, connect, and be emotional online than it is about how many slides you've got and how many bullet points you're going to get through. So it's really important to recognize that. And I think what I've got in the photo with the guy with the baby on his lap is you also never know, right? I've arrived today and they're doing renovations upstairs. So far, touch wood, we've done all right, but you never know. And I think um, recognizing as well that how you start is also about personal context and recognizing that we are still post pan we are post pandemic but we're still in the midst of some weirdness and some working stuff out and so recognizing that and having grace for that moment and saying you know what today i have my kid they've got they're sick they're homesick today and i'm really sorry um he's sitting on my lap he shouldn't bother anyone generally speaking pretty people are pretty adopting of this but acknowledging the weirdness if there's any kind of weirdness or acknowledging that there's a complication to the situation that was unforeseen up front is a really way of avoiding the awkwardness a bit later on down the track as well then we want to go into how you present now this is obviously where people want to get into the meaty bits but really if you've done all of that preparation if you've presented with gratefulness, if you've opened up with context, if you've set yourself up to sound good, to look good, and your structure and your system around you and your, your environment is good and you've got a stable internet connection, look, you're 80% the way there. Now you're into how you present and you know your stuff better than anyone. People rarely remember what you say, but they'll always remember of how you made them feel. And so I want you to think about what do you do in this space that's beyond your content. Product managers are fantastic at talking about their content. They're not always fantastic at talking. So how do we talk really confidently to our audience and engage with our audience? So we want to talk with our hands and we want to talk with our hands directed at the camera. One of the secrets I do, and I'm doing it right now, is in order to get that eyeball contact with the camera is I'm actually running all of the faces along this Zoom call at the top of my screen. That way, my, my conversation is always had with people and the people that I'm speaking to are just underneath my camera. So I'm constantly referring back wherever my head and my hands go, I'm coming back to talking to my audience and my audience sits right there just below my camera. And so it looks like I'm engaging with my camera, even though I'm actually looking at the audience while I'm giving that particular presentation. So move the Zoom call as best you can under your camera and talk to your audience, not just your slides. In fact, this is where the two screens come in. My slides should be over here and I should be speaking to my audience and referring to my slides either with a, with a pointer and I can look over here to look at that pointer and what I'm working on in that space and then coming back to my audience and addressing them via the camera. That's going to get a far more engaging presentation and people are going to feel like you're speaking to them and not at them or not past them. The last thing you want is the kind of presentation where everyone's talking at you like this and they're really, all it just feels like is that you're being talked past and they're not really connected with you at all because you've not got it. And God forbid you do that whilst we're looking up your nose. 
it just doesn't connect it well at all. So changes, subtle changes, nuanced changes about the presentation can make all the difference. Two things to be careful of is pace and tone. So pace, you don't want to talk too fast. You do want to keep a pace. You don't want to slow everything down to a jog, but you do want to have control of the pace. You don't want to come in, like I mentioned before, flustered and rushing and moving from one slide to the next. You want to slow it down. You want to have a conversation. You want to give opportunities for questions and answers. And you want to move from one slide to the next or from one question to the next as gracefully as possible so that you can maintain the pace. Because if you look like you're in control of the pace, they'll feel like you're in control of the conversation. And that's important from a dynamics point of view because you're the one doing the presentation. Now, being in control of the pace is not just the only part. You've also got to be in control of the tone. So you will have noticed throughout this presentation, my pace is up and my pace is down and I'm speaking fast and moving really quickly and then I slow right down. The simple rule in this, if I can give you any rule to carry away with you in terms of pace is speak fast when you've got a lot to say and speak slow when it's really important. So again, if you've got a lot to say, move as quickly as you need to because you're going to move through the content as fast as you can because you want to get to the really important bits. And if you can slow down that pace and speak really clearly to the bits that are important, then you'll get permission to move as fast as you need to through all the other stuff. Does that make sense? And so what you've got is the ability to manage that pace and then add tone and inflection on top of it. So not only are we then talking about the movement of pace back and forward and being able to anchor into things that are really serious, but being able to drop an octave and speak really seriously about this thing you're talking about and then come up and speak and lift those eyebrows and be friendly and be engaging and talk fast and then slow down, but maybe still stay friendly and up in terms of tone, but you're going to slow down and just speak at the pace you need to. Or you might come down low because you're talking about something that's a bit more serious and you're going to move still fast because it's not key information, but it gives you the permission to then stay in that octave or that register and to slow right down. So it's not just about keeping the pace, it's about varying the tone as well. And if you can get master that skill, it's not about putting on a voice, it's not about changing your style, it's about recognizing that it's all four of those. It's fast pace and slow pace, it's high tone and low tone or serious and friendly or however you want to put it. Um, and recognizing that you can mix and match those in four different ways and you get a much more engaging presentation. So what do I do? I slow down. I slow down for those important bits. I speed up when it's less important. And one of the other things I do, and you've seen it throughout this presentation, is I've kicked back from my desk a little bit. I'm not hunched in like I usually do at my desk. I'm sitting back here because I've got a great microphone that can pick up my sound and I can speak with my hands and my entire frame is sitting within the camera's view now. And it gives me a really good presentation that I can use uh, and illustrate and speak to different things and point to different things and whatever else I might need to do. So I like talking with my hands. It becomes a far more engaging conversation and it gives me something that I can use beyond just a slide deck when I'm giving a presentation. Now, what do you present? I want to challenge everyone on this call. What do you present? I would like you to maximize the amount of words not said. Leave your audience wanting more. One of the things you probably want to get out of a pitch is another pitch with more people that are more qualified to have this conversation. Ideally, eventually, you want to be having a pitch with a decision maker. And hopefully at that point, you might be in person or at the very least starting to think about how we're going to meet these people at a conference or at an event or potentially the next time you're in town. So what you're trying to do is not give away everything. One of the worst things I see, and I see it all the time working with startup founders and, and, and um, particularly uh, technical, strong technical leaders 
is they'll jump in and they'll try and do as they'll try and get as much of their message across as possible. The job is to invert that thinking and say, who am I speaking to? What do they really need to know? How do they need to receive it? And how do I give them all of that wrapped in a pretty bow for the least amount of words? Because that will show that you respect their time and will focus in on the things that you believe are important to them. And here's the kicker. If you put everything else in an appendix, what will happen is they'll ask questions that matter to them. And you will know because you're the expert exactly where to go to find that answer and to illustrate that answer. And what that looks like to them is when they start asking questions and moving back and forth in a pitch conversation or a presentation conversation, you can actually move back and forth between your presentation and all the other stuff that you're a font of knowledge on. And that reinforces your position as a, as a subject matter expert or as a business owner or as a potential sales uh, conversation to say, I know what I'm doing, I'm really good at this, and you should listen to me. So the job is be careful of too much information, use an appendix if you have to, and build a, build that wealth of knowledge and have it available and ready to use, but don't feel like you need to use it. And the way you do that is by connecting with the person receiving the information. So the focus needs to be on who am I speaking to, what is important to them, and how do I tell them what they need to hear? Now, to technical leaders, that's actually quite difficult because you, your, your belief is, well, they need to hear what I have to say. The job is, well, no, they need to hear what's important to them out of everything you have to say. So interrogate what you have to say and think to yourself and potentially even role play or, or, or work out with, with a mentor or a friend. Um, wrestle it through. That's part of the thing where maybe that's some coaching we can potentially offer as well in this space is to say, what is it that I really should be presenting and what needs to go to an appendix? So what do I do? I think about what's going to happen after the presentation. I put into a presentation something that can be sent on because I'm not just thinking about the pitch to this individual. I'm thinking about this individual, this team of individuals and how they're going to on-sell this content to someone else. If you're dealing with a major or even a mid-cap, you're going to be dealing with exactly the same problem. It's going to be how do I resource these recipients of my information with enough information for them to be dangerous to on-sell it when I'm not there. Now, if you're a technical leader with a lot of information to share, you're going to feel like that is impossible. So the job is to wind back and say, no, what I'm going to give you is just what you need to hear and everything else is locked up in here. And if you'd like to have another conversation, I'd be more than happy to come in and have another meeting. And so you're trying to engineer the next outcome and start to have a conversation about that. Keep the bullets simple, like I've done with this presentation, trying to avoid too much information, keeping it focused on simple bullet points Pictures on every page. Some people think in information. Some people think in numbers and graphs and, and, and columns and rows. And some people think in pictures. So making sure you've got the ability to speak and show and illustrate what you've got to say. Um, and when you are using things like tables and graphs, one of the things that gives me heart palpitations is seeing people put entire spreadsheets onto a, uh, a presentation. The job is to show a trend. So you can put a whole spreadsheet on there so long as there's almost a clear hockey stick that I can pick out of that, that I don't need to do any analysis work. But chances are, if that's the case, you can graph it for me and then you're not putting a spreadsheet up there at all. You're just showing me a graph and that would be much better to read and interpret and understand. So you want to make sure that you're moving to the showing of clear trends in tables and graphs rather than whole spreadsheets. You're putting pictures in if you don't have anything um, quantitative to share. Um, and anything in detail actually gets spoken in an abstraction. And so rather than thinking about all the different things I've got to say, I just abstract it to things like simple bullets. And I say, put simple bullets in all of your presentations. And what I mean by that is a bunch of other instructions around keeping things the right level and working through your content in a sequence that makes sense to the listener, not just to the talker and giving yourself the time of day needed to talk through all of those pieces of information as well. So that's what you should present. Be careful of too much information, understand what's gonna happen after this conversation and put it as simply and as visually as possible. 
How do you finish? What you actually want to do, and I'll show you this in a minute, is synthesize this presentation down to a simple action or set of actions. So the audience know what the next step looks like. And then you want to summarize what you've presented. And your summary should transition from this is everything we've talked about to this is what we should do next. And that ask needs to be really clear. There's that old saying, you don't have what you don't ask for. It's sort of like if you're looking for investment, ask the investor for money. If you're looking for a new client, ask the potential new client for their business. Say, would you like a trial? Or we're taking uh, expressions of interest in this particular program over the next month. We'd love you to be a part of it. Issue the invitation, transition to that ask and make sure it's clear and easy to buy. Because if it's not, people are going to struggle to make their way there themselves. You've got to make it easy and you've got to make it clear. And you've done all this great work to present well and have the great environment, and be clear and be simple and succinct and audience oriented. The job now is now that you've got them between the barrels is to say, now I'd really love your business. Is this something you'd be interested in? You want to give time to that end of that presentation. You want to let that sit and you want to let people think about it and talk about it. And you want to finish clearly, have an end in sight and know how you're going to finish so that you avoid the awkward endings. Nothing worse than getting to an end of a PowerPoint presentation and there's no question and answer slide or there's no finish slide and you end up with this, right, and yeah, so that's, yeah, that's it. Um, is there any questions? And it gets this awkward, you go from something slick and amazing and really well presented to this awkward, weird handover back to them. And it just, you lose all dynamic in the conversation and you go from being the head of the conversation to being at the uh, beck and call of your customer and you really want to be able to have that pitch conversation that keeps you at the head of the table so you want to make that ask as clear as possible and you want to give your audience a reason to engage with those next steps so being clear on those next steps is absolutely pivotal <clears throat> so to eat my own dog food as my business partner sometimes says um to summarize how are you going to set up? You're going to get your camera as elevated as possible in a well-lit room. How are you going to sound? Well, you're going to know that you've got a good microphone, whether that's on your computer or plugged into your computer or you've got some other way of doing it. You're going to know and have tested that your microphone is good and sounds good on the other side. How you look, you're going to wear the right thing and you're going to look at lighting, lighting, lighting. Make sure you're in a well-lit room and that you look good when the lights are on or off or however it might be. And think about the time of day you're pitching. If you're pitching from an export point of view, it might be the other side of the world and you might be pitching at six o'clock in the morning. I'd be pitching at three o'clock in the morning. If that's the case and it's the middle of the night, how are you going to light up the room? And is the light that's behind you and on the roof sufficient to light the front of your face up in front of a computer? Potentially not. And it might need another lamp or something that's sitting in front of you just to light up the front of your face a little bit better. How do you start? You start with energy and you get people over the hump. You want to start with a story. You want to talk about context. You want to bring the purpose into it. And you want to bring everyone into those first five minutes so that they feel like, okay, now I'm prepared to stay. This is definitely something that I want to listen to and learn about. Then in terms of presentation, you want to keep the pace. You want to maintain that pace. That is your pace to own and control. And you want to vary that tone and you want to go up and down and slow it down and speed it up as much as you need to make sure that you're in control of that particular conversation. And then in terms of what you present, keep it simple. Don't let the technical experts tell you that everything needs to be in it. Let the client or the potential client tell you what they need to see and just give them that and have everything else ready like a loaded gun, waiting for questions, waiting for the next steps and whoever you need to speak to next. You don't have to give everything away in the first conversation or the second for that matter. It's about putting the right information to elicit the next conversation. And we finish by summarizing. Summarizing and asking, how do we go? And where are we going to next? And with that, I'll throw it back to Collins.
Are you there, Collins? <gasps> Sorry, David, it took me a while to take it back from you. Um, every time I tried oh, to control something, it was, it was still controlling on your side. <laughs> so, no problem. <laughs> but we're here now, all, all good. Thanks very much, Dave. That was great. And uh, I'm sure everybody that was on the call today got a great deal of uh, information out of it. I did notice that there were a couple of raised hands over the course uh, of your presentation. If you do have any questions, please, uh, we cannot let you speak, but type them in the Q&A box and do that right now because uh, you'll have the opportunity for Dave to answer those calls. So any questions, please type them in the Q&A box and uh, we'll have a look at those and make sure that uh, we bring them to Dave's attention. And uh, just so that you're across where we're going and what we're doing next, because we've got a lot of good stuff coming up over the course uh, of the next few weeks at the Victoria Mets Export Hub. I'm actually going to introduce uh, my colleague, Grant Philpotts. And Grant is uh, going to give you a sense of all those great events coming up. And remember, while that's happening, if you have any questions for Dave, type them in the Q&A box. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Grant. Thank you, Collins, and thanks, Dave. That was uh, another great session. I know I got a lot out of it. Um, I'll have to get my light on here just to shine me a bit uh, brighter. There we go. Look at that. Oh, geez, that's not pleasant at all, is it? Turn that down. <laughs> um, so uh, just uh, to keep you in place, uh, we have got a smart mining uh, networking event tomorrow afternoon at the Crown Plaza. If you're in Melbourne, you're more than welcome to attend that. Just check our website out for that information there. Um, our capability acceleration program continues with a uh, market selection series of marketing masterclass. Uh, Collins and I are also getting the uh, Ostmine bus going over the next couple of weeks where we're doing some uh, road shows. We go Morwell, uh, Ballarat, sorry, Morwell, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo. I think that's the series we're going in. So we're chugging around the state. I've got my uh, trucking songs ready to go. So we've got some road music going on, a bit of a country and western. I know Collins is looking forward to that. So as we always say, if you want to come to those events, they're all on our website. Uh, most are uh, a breakfast and an evening event so we uh turn on some breakfast for you as well um and if you come to the evening ones there might even be some uh drinks afterwards as well to help the networking flow a bit easier um we always say if you need to register for an event go onto our website www.osmine.com.au go off, click down the events uh tab and you can easily get on all our website and our links there remember uh, you have to you have to register for every event uh, separately, you can't just register for one and then um, believe that goes all the way through. So as we said, uh, 31st of August is our Smart Mining Networking event there at the Crown Plaza. So if you wish to come along to that, let Collins or I know and we can sort that out for you. 12th of October, we've got a CEO luncheon where um, Beaconsfield Mine Reflections, which looks to be a very, very good um, session. Um, so that's uh, the mining, the head of the mine at the time, whose name uh, slips my mind at the moment, a lot of minds going on there. Um, he is um, going to talk about the reflections of what happened during Bakersfield, which I think for a lot of us has been quite a um, seminal moment in um, our lives. Particularly, I, I remember when they when they were found. It was um, something pretty pretty special to me. So we've got that coming up on October the twelfth. Um, then we move into our uh, iMark is coming up the 2nd, the 4th of November in Sydney, which is going to be a great event. Collins and I are both going up to that again. We'll have to get the Osmine bus chugging up the road again for that one. Um, and then after, so you can register there through Beacon Events. So that's where you register. Um, and then after that, we've got our A23, which is uh, Osmine 23 in uh, sunny Adelaide in um uh, May, I think it'll still be sunny and probably not so baking hot over there as what it generally is in Adelaide in most times. Um, so, yeah, so that'll also be good. Uh, so everything you need to know is on our Osmine website, so uh, osmine.com.au, and we go from there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Grant, and uh, can't wait to get the wheels on the bus going round and round uh, to the tune of country music. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited, I can't contain myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dave, we do have one question, a uh, question yep. from Javier. Um, he wants to know, and I, I think I, I probably can anticipate your answer to this one. Um, he asks, in your experience, how much content or how many slides are recommended? So I've got an interesting answer for this one. I've actually moved more recently into um, 
uh, into slides being representative of time. So I would argue that you have four minutes per slide uh, and that four minutes is a relatively good amount of time to talk, um, that anything more than four minutes means you've got too much on a slide and anything less than four minutes means that you're moving too quickly. So it can be sort of three, maybe three minutes you can get away with, but three to four minutes, generally speaking. So I would say, listen, if you've got a 15 minute presentation, four slides. If you've got a half an hour presentation, eight slides. Um, that just gives you a bit more of a good idea of how to truncate all of your content and then go, okay, well, if all I've got is 15 minutes to make my pitch, what four slides are going to do the job? Um, and that can be quite a hard one to actually do. So yes, um, happy to have helped with that one. Brilliant. Thanks. And uh, Javier certainly appreciated that answer as well. And whatever you do, prevent, pre don't go to uh, death by PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A few things as bad as that. Um, it doesn't look as if we have any more questions. Just a reminder uh, that if you are a member of the Victoria Mets Export Hub, and I know not everybody in today's webinar is, but if you are a member of the hub, you also have access uh, to Dave uh, from a mentoring perspective. And mm -hmm. if you drop me an email, uh, we'll have a conversation about how best to approach that. So thank you everyone for being part of today's session. Thanks again, Dave. Um, it's been great. And uh, we look forward to the pleasure of all your company in uh, the not too distant future. Oh, here we've got one final question. Oh, you've got to type faster, Javier. What about, uh, the, use what about the use of tools such, such as Mentic polls, et cetera? So it really depends on your audience, right? Like if I wanted to use polls, I'd be wanting to speak to enough people to get good information quickly. And I'd want to have done the preparation work. So in a pitching export kind of piece, I'd say it's probably not all that useful other than if you were to do it prior to and then demonstrate the data. Um, but if you've got groups of people, say 20, 30 people, or you're giving a presentation at a, you know, at a local chapter of the professional association or something, then potentially that could be quite useful. But um, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably a, a, a little bit old school and I'd say, um, I, I, I'm more of the ilk of one photo, one word on a slide and speak for four minutes and let your, let your content do the talking out of your mouth than big, long, laborious death by PowerPoint, you know, size 12 font on a, on a PowerPoint slide. I'd go size 36 <laughs> font, one or two words on a really nicely thought out design and that's it and speak to that. Or if it's content heavy, like we've done today, Try to keep it to three subheadings and and two to three bullet points under each one of those and just try and keep an architecture to the information you've got so that it's fairly simple. Title, intro slide, subheadings, sub bullet points, the end. Uh, and it's consistent and it's on every slide and it takes you from start to finish. So, um, and if that means that, you know, there's tools that help you do that, then go right ahead. But I'd say... Um, the tools should should follow, not lead. Absolutely. Never be controlled by the tools. Thank you, Dave. Um, looks as if that is the final question. So thanks, Great. everyone, for your pleasure, uh, the pleasure of your company this afternoon. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next session, which uh, for Victoria is on Thursday. So please make a note of that. And uh, I look forward to seeing you online then. Thanks again, Dave. Thanks, Grant. And uh, Thank you. go off and... Make, uh, make some good business, everybody. We look forward to the next time. Keep well. Excellent. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Cheerio.